This morning, I uh, am going to be talking about a couple of different people. One of them is Jesus, and uh, the other is a saint. And I uh, know it's not St. Patrick. I apologize for all of you who were Irish, but if you know the real story of St. Patrick, he wasn't even Irish, he was English, so you should like him if you're Irish, but we'll never mind. So, happy St. Patrick's Day for those of you that are excited about eating corn beef and cabbage later, which I hopefully will find later this afternoon around lunchtime. But until then, give you just a couple minutes. We're going to get you out of here a little early this morning. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about being present. What does it mean to be present? If you go to a meeting and they call roll and, you know, are you here? Hi. No. I'm here. here. That, that could be present. Um, if you are in the right place at the right time, you want to say that you're being present. Okay? Um, if you are in the center of God's will, right where you're supposed to be at the right time, you could say that you are being present. Okay? But what inspired this message this week is the fact that I found myself in the last couple of weeks realizing that I was not present. Okay? So, you get to hear a sermon this morning that I'm preaching to myself. You're welcome. We have been remodeling a very large church on <laughs> the other side of town into a home for quite some time. Um, we purchased the home uh, late summer, early fall of last year. I was not as diligent as I should have been through the fall. I will admit to you in doing all the things that I need to do. So in January, my wonderful, brilliant, talented, loving, gracious father-in-law kicked in the high gear, kicked me in the pants, and we have been working gangbusters at the new church, which has been awesome. We've gotten a tremendous amount of stuff done. We've gotten further along than we could have ever done. I wouldn't have changed any of it except for the part where we worked for six weeks-ish without stopping. <laughs> Day and night, every weekend. That's why I wasn't in church those couple weeks because I was in a pair of good overalls with a tool belt on up on the other side of the town. <clears throat> and then a couple weeks ago, we got a note and a call from one of Piper's teachers. And for you, those of you that don't know, um, Piper was her youngest daughter, and she was born with a micro-chromosome deletion, and we still don't quite have all of the facts on what's going on with Piper, but she's got special needs, and she's in a, uh, a the living skills um, classroom at the Cattersport Elementary School, which is incredible, and the school is awesome, and they're doing all these wonderful things, but as cute as Piper is, because I know you all see her, and she's got a bow, and she's adorable, and she makes everybody smile, she is the bad kid in her class. <laughs> unbelievable ability to be absolutely adorable and have everyone think she's the most angelic being on your really she can pinch you and pull your hair and take things from you and not give them back without any adults noticing. I don't I feel bad for any kids that interact with her because she has this way of just completely snowballing adults and taking everything away from other children. You're like, Piper is so mean. So we got a call about Piper saying that she was demonstrating some behaviors. We'd seen them before and it was all part of part of the process. Of, of her learning and integrating into school, but we, we realized very quickly that some, in talking with Rachel and I, that some of these things were because I wasn't at the house. Now that sounds, well, you're making it all about you. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that for about three weeks, I saw my two youngest children by kissing them through the car window when Rachel would bring them home after they would go to daycare. And it was all in the name of, I'm doing a really good thing here, guys. We're building this house and it's going to be awesome. And in my mind, I was doing a really good thing. And in, in Mike's mind, he was doing a really good thing. And we were doing a really good thing, but at what cost? So, just a couple of little tweaks. We still worked in the evenings, but I cut it a little bit short. Made sure I was home for bedtime. Made sure that I spent a little bit more time at the breakfast table. Whatever. She's had a good week at school. Whether or not it was directly related to that. But I realized that I wasn't being present. This time in my life, the Lord has called me to be a husband and a father first. Now hear me. Okay? I also preach on Sundays. I also very poorly played the drums this morning. Sorry, Ian, if you're here, I know you want to leave off, but I'm sorry you had to do that. Um, I also work a full-time job. I also love to be in the woods. I also love to play 
play darts with my friends. You know, all of these things that make up chip. But, where are my efforts focused? Okay? Where are my main efforts focused? What time in my life am I in right now that God has called me to, and am I doing the things that I need to do well in that area to make sure that that area, that first box is checked first? Okay? Is everybody with me? And so right lately, I can say that I have it. It's been upside down. It's been in the name of, but I'm doing a really wonderful thing for my family. We're building this house, and it's going to be awesome, and we're excited, and this, that, the other thing. But I realized in that that I had also my body, okay? I have a bad back because of, I've been overweight for years, self-inflicted. I work way too long, way too many hours when I had my own business, self-inflicted. I worked manual labor since I was 19 because I decided not to listen to my parents and not go to college, self-inflicted. Nothing wrong with manual labor, but all of us that are in our 40s that have worked manual labor our entire lives know exactly what I'm talking about when you can't walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night because you hurt so bad. That's what I'm talking about. So my body has been in such bad pain. I've got a situation in my back that I just keep aggravating and keep aggravating. And, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, my buddy Adam and his friend Joe came down. Actually, his, Adam's daughter Sally is joining us today. She surprised Adia, one of her best friends from back in New York. So welcome. And my parents are also here today. So thank you for coming down to spend some time here with us. But Adam came down and he still, we did some contracting work for a couple of years together. Um, and he still does that every day. And his partner still does that every day. And in two days, we hung 85 sheets of drywall most of which were 12-footers. And uh, these guys worked like four men. And I was just chasing around after them, trying to keep up remembering what it was like to be able to work that hard. And, and like the test, I, they left, and they got in the car, and I flopped out, and I ripped my back brace off, and I took my tool belt off and dropped it on the floor, and I swung back into the chair with excruciating pain. I said, oh, thank God, I don't have to pretend that I can keep up with these guys. <laughs> So, in the process of realizing that I had done my children a disservice and that I had done my body a disservice, I realized that I really wasn't that happy. We were getting a tremendous amount of work done. I had been spending more time with my father-in-law. I can say that we, he's not just my father-in-law anymore. He's my friend and my brother because we, we bonded. As you know, when you work with somebody, you, you joke and you laugh and you listen to music and you tell those stories. And so I feel closer to him than I ever have. I'm super excited about that. I have all these wonderful positive things that are happening. The drywall's up, the wiring is getting done, all of these things are happening. It's being paid for, the money, the provision. But I was miserable. And I was standing on my porch and I'm like, I'm in excruciating pain. There's stuff going on with my kids. I miss my kids. I miss my wife. We're doing the right thing. We're doing good things. And the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, When's the last time you talked to me? And I realized that I wasn't being present. And so I can say that my first job is to be a husband and a father, but really my first job is to be a child of the King and a son of God. Amen? So, in the Bible, we have many references to the way that Jesus would like us to be present. Matthew 6, Matthew 5 and 6, if this is something that you're struggling with, at the end of this, if you say, yeah, I want, to, I want to think more about this, and I want to process this more, and I want to pray through this, I would suggest that you spend the next week reading Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 over and over again. And after you realize that you're probably not actually saved, then keep reading it, and then maybe you'll sort of figure it out, which is where I'm at. I'm not sure if I'm totally saved yet, but we're getting there. Okay, so Matthew 5 and 6 is the Sermon on the Mount. We've all heard that. And Jesus is talking, Matthew 5, there's the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, for they should, okay, blessed are the peacemakers, we see all that, okay? But at the end of chapter 6, he gets done and he's talking about giving to the needy, and he talks about doing it without people knowing, and he talks about prayer and fasting, and in chapter um, 6, we find the Lord's Prayer. Then he starts teaching about money and possessions, and he says, don't store up treasures here on earth, for moss eats, eats them, and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal, store your treasures in heaven. For moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. 
Okay, it says that your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Jesus goes on to say, this is in red, No one can serve two masters for you. will hate one, love the other. You'll be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear, or a new house, or the latest car, or the best TV, or bank roll money for your kids when they go to college. Now people are starting to look at me. What is he talking about? Yeah, when I was listening on Family Life this week, and there was a financial planner, and he was talking about how to tithe on your investments and and. A guy called in and he was talking about, so at the end of the year, my dividends, I'm wondering if I tithe on the return of the investment that was the original number, or if I just tithe off the gains, and if I had a loss on that particular account, I'm like, this guy has more than one account? Like, what is this guy? What is he talking about? Now, I know some of you are, so good to financial planners and financial investors, and, and, and that's awesome, because you use that money to bless the kingdom of God, and that's great. But for me, that's like, We've got a bank account, a checking account, a savings account, and we like haven't had checks for like a year. Like we need to write a check, we have to go to the bank and they have to give the check and this whole thing. And and so like the money thing doesn't make any sense to me, which is probably why we don't have anything because we're horrible. <laughs> but with that being said, there's so many people this whole lives, their whole thought process, their whole reason for getting up in the morning is to succeed is to be the best, is to win, is to be, you know, to have enough, to be, to be secure. If, if I only have enough, if I only have this much in this account, we'll be okay. And if we can get ahead this far, we'll be okay. And if, and if we, we got to start saving, we can't do this vacation because we got to save up for our, our kids' college and this, that, and the other thing. And we have friends that, that are doing the, um, oh, Dave Ramsey course. And they've had incredible success at it. And I, I respect them exponentially because some of them are debt free. I, I can't even imagine that. That's incredible. And that comes from dedication. But the, the question, and I'm not asking this question to them because I, I, I don't worry about what they do with their money. But if you're in that point and you've got all this money and you're storing up all this stuff, what are you doing with it? So we read on and Jesus says, and don't worry about your clothing. Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. A wildflower is this little green thing that grows up out of the ground. And then there's this colorful thing. I know it was about a county. And it's been a really long time. But they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. They're called flowers. They're amazing. They're going to love them. It might be June, but it's coming. <laughs> so he says, don't worry, for the Father already knows your needs. He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. What will, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows your needs. So here we have this, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Yeah, Chip, that sounds great. You know, peace, love, man. Sounds like some hippy dippy nonsense. When you hold it up to the American dream. I'm going to get real with you. Okay? I'm not, don't worry, I'm not bashing America. Remember we went through this, I love America. I love that I live here. I'm proud. But oftentimes our ideologies of what we need to be and what success looks like is completely contrary to the kingdom message. Completely contrary to what Jesus is teaching. And if we're going to get real, there's lots of preachers on TV and there's lots of preachers on the radio that will say, God wants you to have a new Lamborghini. And if you're in a position, we were talking this morning, 
about somebody that got a, 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 new, a new sports car, but this person is an extremely benevolent person. If you're giving it away just as much as you're spending it, then praise God. But if you're hoarding it and spending it, then you've got a real problem in God's eyes. See, we use lots of Old Testament scriptures to justify our gain, to justify our need to have stuff, our, our, to justify our need to, to be fiscally and financially prepared for the future. And now I know some of this, some people in this room are going are gonna to be rubbed the wrong way by this message. But just hear my heart. Don't hear, don't hear the chips saying, you shouldn't have a bank account, you should give all your money away. No, I'm asking you to listen to what God is speaking to you. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm encouraging you and provoking your thoughts to ask God this week, am I being present as a son or daughter of God? And what does that look like? So, there was a man. He was born on October... No, that's not right. He died in October. Sorry. He was born in... 1181. Okay? His uh, name was Giovanni. His father was an Italian cloth merchant. Extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy family. So, Giovanni grows up in a house where he has everything he ever needs, he's educated. He is, is current on all the, the latest music, you know, the Baroque, you know, I don't know what the Luton Lyre, I mean, but they were rocking out to whatever the latest medieval thing was going on. Lute, I, don't, I don't know what Lute is, but it was, it was hit. He was into it. He was, he was, he was the popular guy. Okay, he, you need to understand. He was the, the top echelon of, of the area that he lived. He was, he was one of the cool kids. He was the, the kid with the letter jacket, the captain of the football team, you know, had it all together, had the full ride to college on the sports scholarship, are you with me? Okay? He had it all together. And then when he was 21 years old, he went off to war, and it was a time during where there was crusades, and he was doing some things, and a couple of the regions were warring against each other, and he goes into this terrible war, which I can only imagine, um, war is terrible today, but we... But back then, it was all face-to-face -face combat with swords and armor and arrows, and you know you were only you know, you were this close to your enemy, and you didn't get to just lob stuff. And and so I can't imagine what that was like. And so he enters into this combat, and and, and he wanted to be a knight. The, the the recorded history says that he wanted to be a knight. He thought it was awesome. It was the pinnacle of the society at the time. And so he goes off and realizes very quickly that, whoa, this is not exactly what I want to do. Then he gets captured. He spends a year in um, the prison of the other, um, it's irrelevant, the name of the other people, but he spends a year in prison, um, locked in basically a box. And then he comes home because his father buys his way out. So they would capture these really top echelon guys and hold them for ransom until their families would fuel the war by giving them more money. This happened over and over and over again. So he had a target on his back from day one. So he spends a year in the prison and he comes home. And something's different. Okay? Something's a little different. And he had been picked on when he was younger because he always had this real softer side for the poor. There's a recounted story that he was out in the marketplace. He was selling for his father, and, and, and a, a beggar comes up and gives him, asks him for alms. And he refuses him politely in front of his friends and, and those that, that were. But then he gets caught because he quickly, as soon as the beggar goes off, he runs after this guy and finds him. He gave him everything he had in his pockets. So there was two sides to this man. But somewhere in here, he comes home and he begins to do the work of the Lord. He gets a vision from the Lord that says, I want you to go and rebuild my house. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? He was born Giovanni, but shortly after he was born, his father returned home from a trip and named him Francis because his mother was French and his father had a fascination with the uh, with French culture. 
we're talking about St. Francis. And so for St. Francis, at about 22 years old, is finds himself standing in the town square where his father is accusing him of giving away his stuff to the poor. And St. Francis is torn and he says, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. And the historical account says that he just, he completely and totally disrobed in the town square. Now today we think, oh my goodness. But this was him symbolically shedding all of his wealth, all of his position, all of his authority, everything, the, the, the temporal things of earth, and he just shed them and said, you know what, I'm even going so far as that I'm going to denounce my own father and say that Jesus Christ is my one true father. And St. Francis went on to do incredible things. He started by rebuilding a local, uh, local church that had been, that had been um, dilapidated. He did that uh, in various other places around the region of Assisi. And he has gone on to be venerated as a saint by the Catholic Church, but, but he's, he's gone on. They start the, the, the Franciscan Order uh, and also uh, various women's organizations that, that, that are still continuing on to this day. But one of the things that they did was they took an extreme vow of poverty. Okay? And now when we talk about that in the American church, everybody starts getting nervous. Okay? Because we like our stuff. I like my stuff. Right? I like my stuff. I have a collection of instruments, and, and as a matter of fact, that today, um, Adam that was here, I'm sending home a bass guitar with him. He sent me down a guitar, and I love this bass. And we made a deal to trade it, and, and, and I'm going to miss it. I was thinking about it this morning when I got it out of the rack at home where I had eight other bases. Right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But I love my bases. I, I haven't ever showed you any of them. I don't ever bring them and show them off and say, look how awesome these are. No, they're in a rack covered in about a quarter inch of dust in the corner of my bedroom. But I got them. And they're mine. And you're not getting them. You see where I'm going? This is a big scope. And I realized so quickly that, that Jesus here in Matthew is saying, you know, the, the, they say that the other, the other scriptures in the Bible say the love of money is the root of all evil. Boy, is that true. Because when you trace it all back, when you trace it all back, it all comes back down to material things and material possessions and what you've got. And, what, and guess what? We can't take it with us, okay? We can't, we can't go to heaven with it. Yes, we can leave it for our children. Yes, we can. And, and, and um, Solomon said that you know a wise man lays up an inheritance for his children, for his children's children. Now I'm not saying not to do that. Okay, that's a good thing. That's a biblical thing. But what I'm asking is, where is your heart in it? Are you present? in your finances? Are you present in the time that you have, the 24-hour day period that you have from one day to the next, from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to bed? Are you being present in the kingdom? Because Jesus said that seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything else, what will we wear, what will we eat, where will we sleep, are the gas prices going to go up again? It's going to spring soon. Where's my kid going to go to college? Are we going to be able to pay the heat bill? The Bible says that all those things will be added unto you. And so I realized that in my desire to provide for my family, in my desire to get this house done in an expedited order because I made promises that I now couldn't keep, in my desire to do things well, I have completely and totally left God out of the equation. Now I was talking to him. We, you know, we were we were we were conversing, and I was occasionally reading my Bible, but. 
but the day-to-day -day conversations that we would have, the intimacy that we would have, and whether it be in the car or in the mirror when I'm getting ready in the morning, or whether it was in those few minutes when you're waking up, or the few minutes before you're going to bed, the times that you steal away with God and the Holy Spirit to communicate with Him and to talk to Him about what's going on, those things have been completely pushed aside in the name of good works. Anybody follow me? Now, there's lots of us in this room, and we're all in different seasons of our lives. Some of us are young, okay? Some of us are young men and women. You can call them boys and girls if you want, but young men, young ladies that are in school, that your job right now is to get an education, that's to do well, that's to excel, that's to learn how to be socially competent with your peers and learn how to, to interact on sports teams and learn how to obey your parents and learn how what it looks like to maybe get that first job or to learn how to work hard. And that's the season that you're in. Do it well. Then there's some of us that have finished school that are that are waiting to get into the police academy or that are that are that are saving money to go to college or that are in college that are that are continuing on that path. And you have a little bit more time. And other people do those things well. Then there's some of us that are that are raising children and have children of young ages, diapers, toddlers. God bless you all. We're there. We're doing it with you. That's our mission right now. That's where God has us. That's where God's asking us to be present is in our home and in our families. Yes, we have jobs. Yes, we have careers. Yes, we have extracurricular activities. But our focus has to be what? Raising those kids. We made them. Right. <laughs> you know, not to talk about this publicly. We're not live streaming right now. This will be on YouTube. But I work in a, in a classroom where I've got lots of kids. With, you can just look at them and know that maybe their parents weren't present. Aren't present, won't be present, and they suffer because of it. We had a great training about trauma informed care and how to deal with a kid that's looking at you and freaking out and, and cursing and cussing and yelling. And I, I encounter this daily, by the way, where they're just raging in front of you in this class. The idea was to teach us on how to look through the trauma informed glasses and say, what is this kid living with? What has this kid seen? What has this kid gone through that's making him act this way? Because normal kids don't act this way. And in talking with Greg Oliver, who's my supervisor at work, we said how awesome it would be. The class was incredible. And it was extremely informative. But I said, there's such a piece missing. There's such a Christ piece missing that if you couple that gospel message and the, the idea that Jesus Christ loves you and has a purpose and a plan for your life, with that trauma-informed care, the incredible things that it can do. But see, that's our job. We are the Christ piece. And if you're a doctor and you're working and you're taking care of people and you're doing everything you can with the, with the knowledge and the information and the science that God has given you and that you've processed and understood to help heal people and to do His work, that's an incredible thing. But you have to be present in that to do it, right? And if you're a truck driver and you're out on the roads and you're hauling water back and forth to a gas well, Okay? You have to be present, or you're going to do what? Well. Something bad's going to happen. You got, you know, 20 ton that you're driving. I mean, if you're not engaged. But so let's expand that and say that all of those things are included and hidden in your identity in Christ now that you've become a Christian. Now that you've put on Christ, your number one focus has to be the kingdom. Jesus said it. Is everybody with me this morning? And so I realized that I had gotten so wrapped up in what I was doing, where I was at, what we, you know, what we were accomplishing, and how awesome this is, that I completely let some of my relationships in my life and completely let some of the things go. And, and this is only a short time ago. I'm still working through this. I'm still making things right. This is not a yesterday. This is a today thing. Okay? And I realized very quickly that I was talking the talk but not walking the walk. And ironically enough, this man has some incredible quotes. One of them being, it 
it's no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Ouch. Right? I'm like, why does this guy have so many great things to say that were recorded? It's because he spent so much time with the Spirit of God. Because he stripped away all the other earthly things. Now, we can't do that. We've all boxed ourselves in to a life. Okay? I, we could raise our hands and we could probably count over a million dollars worth of school debt in this classroom. Okay? I'm not talking against school debt. Everybody gets worried when I start talking about that. I'm not speaking against anything. I'm just saying we've made those choices. We've made choices to get us where we are to today. Okay, so we can't really go out into the public market, strip off all our clothes and say, you know what, I'm done. You know what, quick and loans, you can have the house, Ford Motor Company, you can have the car. Kids, good luck. I'm giving my life to Jesus. We, can't, we, we don't have that luxury. It'd be cool. We do see people do that, that are radically called to become missionaries, that it happens in the middle of their life, and they sell everything, and, and, and fundraise, and, and make a way to move to Gula Gula land, and live with the Gula Gula people, and, and they just do it. But it's very rare, and, and let's be honest, that's not happening in here, unless, I mean, it, it could. But I'm saying, we all have responsibilities, and jobs, and careers, and tasks, commitments, and things that we have to fulfill. But my question to you is, are we being present in all of those things? Last week, Pastor Kevin made a plea for the kids in this year. Okay, so going back to our responsibilities and what we have. So some of us are raising kids. Okay? Some of us have no kids in the house. We're empty nesters. Okay? Some of us are retired, loving it, Enjoying the grandkids, helping out with the grandkids, helping your crazy son-in-law renovate a really big project, you know. But inside of all of those things, I want to challenge you to say, are you putting the kingdom first? Can you give up a Sunday once a quarter to help in the children's ministry? Yeah, but I got three kids and I'm stressed and you don't understand and I'm working and I'm already volunteering on the worship team and I'm already renovating the house and I'm doing all this stuff and I want to do this and I want to do it and, but we'll help you with whatever you need. You know what I got told? No. You're not helping in the children's ministry. You're already serving in something. You're already too busy. No. But let me ask you this. How many people in this room Get up on a Sunday morning, have a leisurely cup of coffee, maybe make an egg, watch the news, read the newspaper. Huh, oh, it's time to go to church. Come to church, do church, talk for a little bit, drink a cup of coffee, head home, figure out what you're going to eat for lunch, take a nap. This is my perfect life. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do when I'm 65, I promise. But at the same time, if that's you, whether you're of retirement age or whether you're 25, I don't know, could you give a Sunday? Chief, you're asking us to shed things in our life, but you're also asking us to commit to others. What are you doing? I'm asking you to take a look at your life and say, what is it that I'm doing and put, putting all of my effort and attention into and driving and striving and, and going nonstop and I have to be the best and I have to be the committed and I have to be ready for that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. I'm asking you to look at those things this week. I'm asking you to read chapter 5 and 6 of Matthew and say, what is it in my life that I can shed? What is it in my life that I can get rid of? And if you're really, really struggling with this concept, find something in your house this week that you really, 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 really like. One of your favorite things. I learned this from a cousin of mine who's walking down a path of, of enlightenment and this self-discovery and all of these wonderful things and she's into all of these interesting things. <clears throat> Not things that, that I am totally agreeing with or um, even understand, I will say. She's not a Christian, um, but she's, she's finding her peace and being one with the universe and all of this stuff. Except that all of the things that she's saying, coupled with the Christ message, is Jesus. <laughs> We talked about it briefly at Christmas. I'm like, 
We believe so many things that are the same, except for the part where you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And that's okay, that's her. But she made a post a couple weeks ago, and she, she said, if you're struggling with holding on to things, and you're struggling with, with, with amassing stuff, find something that you really, really, really like, and give it away. And so this morning, I'm going to dare you. If you're struggling with stuff, and what it looks like to have things and to amass stuff, and you want to refocus and say, God, I want to refocus my, my attentions, my efforts, my finances, my, my mindset back to you and your kingdom. Find something that you really, really like and that you just hold on to and treasure and glow about and give it to somebody. I've done it many times in my life, and it's one of the most freeing things ever. Do I still hold on to things? Do I still have eight bass guitars in my bedroom? Yes. But it helps recenter us. See, that's the thing. It's like a lot of times we hear a sermon and we think, oh my goodness, here we are, and I'm going to walk out the door and I'm going to apply the sermon and everything in my life is going to be fantastic and everything's going to change and everything's going to be different. That never happens. That's not reality. Okay? It's a day-to-day -day struggle. It's a day-to-day -day reaffirming of who we are. It's a day-to-day -day thing of saying, God, I want to be present. Okay? I want to know what it's like to be in your presence. So Jesus again says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you what? Read it with me. Everything you need. Does it say everything you want? Ouch. See, it doesn't line up with our cultural identity in 21st century post-Christian America. It says everything you need, not everything you want. And it says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I say amen. I've got enough stuff going on today. But I realized in the last few weeks that I wasn't focused on today. I was focused on tomorrow. And I was focused on what would be, and a deadline, and we need to, and we have to, and we should. And people in my life, in my immediate family, suffer for it. And so I know this is simple, and we're closing. Let's take this into our hearts this week as we close. St. Francis of Assisi gave up everything. Gave up the American dream for desolate poverty and cleansing lepers, feeding the poor. Gave up his entire identity. But in his time, he was present fully for the kingdom. And he changed the world. You can change the world. You can change your world. Which then, in, fact, in, in, in effect, affects a bigger world. And then it affects the county. And then it affects the state. And then it affects the country. One person can start a movement, right? Okay? The What's the song, kiddo? I only got one match, but I can make an explosion, right? Yeah, it's, it's a line for it. It's a great, it's, I've only got one match, but I can make an explosion. That one little ember can, can turn into a raging fire. And so St. Francis said, start by doing what's necessary. Then do what's possible. And then suddenly you're doing the impossible. Okay? So start by doing what's necessary. God, this week I would ask that you would speak to the hearts of your people through your Holy Spirit, that you would refocus their attention on being present where they are. Whatever stage of life you have them in, Lord God, that you would focus them in and say, this is what I've called you to do for this time, for this place, for this purpose. And then, Lord God, introduce the kingdom element into that. What does it mean to put the kingdom first in that time, place, and space, Lord God? And then, Lord Jesus, then do what's possible. 
Lord, then with the extra time that we have, Lord, I ask that you would give us renewed vision of how we can advance your kingdom in Potter County. Lord, how we can help specifically with this church, with our community, community involvement, how we can help our neighbor. How can we use our time better and wiser to do those things once we free ourselves from what we think we need into what we think we don't have and focus on what we realize is necessary. And then, Lord God, I ask that then we would see the impossible happen, that we would see our time multiply, that we would see our finances multiply, that we would see our efforts multiply. And, Lord God, that we would begin to see the impossible happen in this church, in this town, and in this community, and in this country, and in this world, Lord God. That, Lord, we as individuals would work together separately, Lord God, to focus in on your kingdom so that then we can corporately see your kingdom advance, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just begin to speak to us boldly and loudly, Lord, and that we would respond quickly to your voice, Lord Jesus, that's telling us to shed the material possessions, Lord, that's calling us to focus in on what you have for us, what the kingdom plan for us is, and what that looks like for our families, for our friends, for our neighbors, and for our community. Go with us this week, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name.